financial bombshell threatening councils across the country the billions owed to the women they underpaid. Cleaners, carers, teaching assistants all paid lower than men in comparable jobs. Glasgow and Birmingham councils are already having to pay out millions now. In an exclusive report, Anushka reveals how widespread it could be. Could this affect every council? At the moment, we are still evaluating how far and how deep this discrimination goes, but everywhere we look, we find some form of discrimination. It's a battle for equality, you might presume, belong to history, but the present reality is that it could bankrupt some councils when money is tight enough already. Anushka will take us through it, also on News at 10 tonight. This is like a war zone. Oh, my God. Apocalyptic scenes and mass evacuations from Hawaii ravaged by wildfires. 36 lives have been lost and a major disaster declared. 12,000 jobs at risk as high street staple Wilco goes into administration. A hair-raising journey to the edge of space, Virgin Galactic's astro-tourists, including an Olympian from Staffordshire and... Duran Duran's Andy Taylor speaks out about his prostate cancer and tells Nina of the good fortune of trialling a new drug. What has this treatment given you? Hope. I've been given every dream in life I ever wanted, including my life back. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. The arguments for equal pay for men and women for work of equal value are, of course, clear and many would presume long settled. But the case for parity is still being fought against local councils by unions on behalf of female members. Tonight, we can reveal new claims against councils in Coventry, Dundee and two in Cumbria, with 20 more on the way. Claims which could leave the councils with such big bills that they may have to cut back on already hard-pressed services. In 2018, over 8,000 women went on strike in Glasgow. Carers, cleaners, school cooks, teaching assistants, all employed by the council. Rosemary McGowan was among those marching. At George Square, she remembers looking up at a window and shouting at the council's chief executive. I, I don't know, I just looked up and I went, Susan Aiken, are you listening? And then they began to sing. Susan Aiken, hear us say, equal pay and walk away. Organiser Francis, cleaning supervisor Rosemary and carer Yvonne saw that as a critical turning point. This month they all received payouts to compensate years in which jobs done mainly by women were paid less than those done by men. I never think for a minute that thousands of women are going to get together and that's exactly what happened. Glasgow has already paid out £770 million and now Birmingham Council says bringing up the pay of its female workers could cost them between £650 and £760 million. But it's not just Glasgow and Birmingham. ITV News can reveal that 550 women, all members of the GMB union, have lodged equal pay claims across two councils in Cumbria. 200 women are doing the same in Coventry amid allegations of preferable working practices for refuse workers who are primarily men. And in Dundee there are 400 cases with claims that bricklayers, joiners and roofers get preferable bonuses to caterers, cleaners and carers. Beyond that, the GMB union is also collecting evidence in 20 more councils. Could this affect every council? At the moment we are still evaluating how far and how deep this discrimination goes but everywhere we look we find some form of discrimination and employers across this country need to wake up and take their responsibilities on equal pay seriously. The challenge being grappled with in Glasgow that could soon be a headache here in Carlisle where Cumberland Council has its headquarters is who is going to pay to fix this problem. After all, councils are totally dependent on public money. One MP suggested councils might need bailing out. To ask the council taxpayers to face more cuts is almost unachievable. So I think we have to look to central government and say uh, we need extra help for councils. 
But in Carlisle and Cumbria, these organisers say it's about fairness, and that's why women are coming forward, even if they're nervous. People are worried when they take legal claims because it's a serious thing to do, but they know that they're worth more, they know they should have equal pay. All the councils ITV News has named acknowledge the challenge they face. Susan Aitken, leader of Glasgow City Council, admitted the price of discrimination is a high one and Glasgow will be paying it for a long time. For these campaigners, the fight is certainly not over. I mean, this is just a matter of basic fairness, isn't it? But we are talking about councils having to find billions. When could people start feeling the impact of this? Well, it is really, really difficult. If you just look at the case of Birmingham, for example, they've admitted huge potential liabilities and they have stopped all non-essential spending. Now, they're grappling with what that actually means, but councils have a statutory duty to provide social care, to provide children's services. That's why there are worries about things like how often is your bin collected? How often is the grass cut? Will your library be secure? Now, Rishi Sunak was asked about this and he said, we're not going to bail out a council for financial mismanagement. But what I think our investigation shows is this isn't about one council. It's about an issue all over the country. And I spoke to the government about this to say, today to say, if it is wider, will you do something? And they very much stuck to the Prime Minister's guns. They said all of these councils are independent lawyers and it is up to them to stick to the law. But of course, Julie, the difficulty is this is public money and it is people like ourselves and everyone who will suffer as a result. But on the other side, what looks like a huge injustice to the lowest paid women. We spend a lot of time focusing on women at the top of the pile. These are women on the shop floor, if you like, and they're doing jobs that are very important to us. One big thing that's changed is that the carers, the teaching assistants and others, their jobs have become much, much more complicated. And the claim here is that their pay has not kept up. OK, Anushka, I know you will keep across uh, all this for us. Thank you very much indeed for that. Now, one glimpse of the jagged orange columns of flames coursing across America's 50th state on the Hawaiian island of Maui. And President Biden could hardly do anything else. He's declared a major disaster. At least 36 people have been killed. Maui, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, is the second largest of the Hawaiian islands. These are the major areas burning out of control, including its main town, Lahaina, which has all but been destroyed. Satellite pictures, this is Lahaina, just two months ago, reveal the devastating extent of the damage. This was yesterday. Look at that difference. Much of the town now reduced to ash. Let's go! The fires ripped through Maui at such speed there was little time to flee. There's fire through there! Go! These residents recorded their own terrifying escape, go, go, showing go. why this has been so deadly. You go, bro. Yeah, go, go, go. The only road out, a rapidly on, narrowing corridor on, as smoke and flames quickly close in. Anyone who had not been able to get out was completely surrounded by a ring of fire now wrapped around this Hawaiian island. Careful right here. But flames have reached all the way to the coast. The only route out for some is by sea and debris from land burns all around them. Those without boats have had to jump into the water and swim for their lives. Still get dead bodies in the water, floating, and on the seawall. They've been sitting there since last night. We've been pulling people out since last night, trying to save people's lives. And I feel like we're not getting the help we need. 36 have been confirmed killed here so far. Thousands left homeless. Looking at the destruction here, many Maui know what's going on. Rescue teams are still I trying to get in. This is like a war zone. Even experienced pilots are shocked by the scale of devastation. Oh my gosh. We were not prepared for what we saw. All the places that are tourist areas that are Hawaiian history are gone. You know, it can't be rebuilt. It's lost forever. Satellite images show what was and what's been lost. Community after community, almost wiped off the map. This was someone's home, now reduced to ashes. We thought we were okay, but then the wind came, the gas stations blew up, everything caught fire by the brush, and then we just had to evacuate. The fire started after a prolonged period of dry weather in Maui. The grasslands and high winds have helped it spread. 
Hawaii is now in a state of emergency. The US National Guard has been mobilized trying to bring this under control and President Biden has promised federal aid. Our prayers with the people of Hawaii, but not just our prayers. Every asset we have will be available to them. And we've seen, they've seen their homes, their business destroyed, and some have lost loved ones. And it's not over yet. Still though, these fires spread. Maui remains engulfed and precious little on this island is being spared. Peter Smith, News at 10 in the United States. The greatest fear about the police data breach in Northern Ireland was that the information would fall into the wrong hands. According to the force's chief constable, it may have done. Dissident Republican groups claim to have got hold of some of it, even if they haven't. The force is taking no chances and advising officers and civilian staff how to deal with the heightened risk. Chief Constable Simon Byrne accepted that trust in the police had been broken. Home from holiday and under pressure. The Chief Constable was asked if this data breach was a resigning matter as he arrived at the policing board. I'll deal with that later. Inside, senior officers were grilled during a lengthy and robust meeting. Media had been invited to a press conference shortly after midday. That didn't take place for another two hours, giving an indication of just how many questions policing board members had. When the Chief Constable eventually addressed the media, he confirmed the PSNI's biggest fear appears to be playing out. An early worst case scenario that we have been dealing with is that third parties would attempt to get this data to intimidate, corrupt or indeed cause harm to our officers and staff. We are now aware that dissident Republicans claim to be in possession of some of this information circulating on WhatsApp and as we speak we are advising officers and staff about how to deal with that and any further risk that they face. There have been many descriptions put on this data breach. The Chief Constable summed it up today, saying it was on an industrial scale. No staff have had to move home yet. However, steps are being taken today to assess if some police officers need to be redeployed away from their usual place of work. Officers with concerns are already contacting their bosses with fears for their safety. The last report we got was 300 and this is nine hours old, 300 people have gotten in touch with worries. I think that's going to increase. And as I said earlier, these are individuals, and this has to be de dealt with on an individual basis, and that's a colossal task. You know, in terms of uh, dealing with the welfare of people, um, is the system there to deal with that? I doubt. Despite the length of the meeting, there were no calls for the Chief Constable to resign from any members. He is the head of the organisation. I think it's premature to be calling for anyone's head at this stage. We're early days in relation to this investigation or investigations because there's clearly more than one issue going on here. So I think given, given uh, the time that it'll take to work that through, I mean, there may be an opportunities in the future that somebody may be held responsible for this, but I think those, those days are far, far too premature uh, today. After a tough day, Simon Byrne remains as Chief Constable for now, at least. His next task is a mammoth one, rebuilding trust within the PSNI and protecting his officers. Jordan Motes, News at 10, Belfast. Now, it had always seemed one of the high street success stories. What could possibly go wrong selling low price homeware and hardware? But the hard truth is that it has. Wilco has been struggling to keep going. Today, it finally threw in the towel and called in administrators. 12,000 Wilco workers are in serious danger now of losing their jobs. Their best hope is that a buyer can be found at this late stage, perhaps for just part of the business. It will, though, keep trading for the time being. Wilco, the home of family value, set up in the 30s by the Wilkinson family. But is this the end? Tonight, as crunch talks continue, hundreds of workers' jobs are in jeopardy. I had a call with uh, Wilco workers at uh, nine o'clock this morning. That was the first time that many of those workers were hearing that news. And it was an incredibly emotional call. People were understandably very sad, visibly upset. 
There are more than 400 Wilco shops across the whole of the UK, but Wilco sales have been steadily declining. It made a loss of almost £36 million in its last financial year. That's more than its profits from the previous four years. Now, with the company going into administration, 12,000 jobs have been put at risk. You can buy homeware on the high street, a bargain store, but with strong competition trying to move up market and I think I get caught in between the low price retailers, the ones that are really aggressively low price, and the quality retailers. The administrators have said that sales were impacted by the pandemic and cost of living crisis. They have confirmed though that they'll continue to operate from all its stores without any immediate redundancies. In an open letter, the company's chief executive said we needed to make significant changes to the way we operate to restore confidence and stabilise. We left no stone unturned when it came to preserving this incredible business. I feel sorry for the people that work here, you know, at the end of the day, because there's not many jobs round here. And there's such nice people. I think it's a shame, really. It is cheap and it's affordable and you get all the little gadgets and bits and bobs from there. It was a thriving place one time. And when you look round, everywhere's empty. You know, we need these shops. There's still a chance for the Wilco name to be saved if some of the stores or part of the business is bought. If not, the entire chain faces liquidation. Hopes of a rescue slim, but not entirely over yet. Kelly Foran, News at 10, Manchester. The number of people waiting to start NHS treatment in England is one in eight. There are 7.6 million in the queue, a new, depressing but somewhat inevitable record. However, waits in A&E departments were down and ambulance response times were slightly better too. The latest four-day strike over pay by junior doctors begins Jesus. at seven tomorrow morning. Now, that there is sometimes a difference between what politicians say and what they actually do is not exactly a new phenomenon. When p and ferries sacked most of its workforce and replaced them with cheaper agency workers, the Transport Secretary at the time, Grant Shapp, said the government was considering cancelling its contracts with the company and switching to other providers. But that was then. Joel has now discovered that the government has since spent more than a quarter of a billion pounds with the ferry business and its parent company. It's the peak of the summer season at the port of Dover. P&O Ferries operates four ships here and traffic is almost back to pre-COVID levels. Some customers are returning, others never left. Despite condemning P&O for sacking hundreds of its crew, His Majesty's government is still spending a lot of money with the company and its owner. The government have failed to match their words with actions. Uh, they've sat back, they've allowed P&O ferries to get away with it. And worse than that, they've actually awarded them hundreds of millions of pounds in taxpayers' cash. Written parliamentary questions submitted by the MP Louise Hay reveal the Ministry of Defence has made payments of almost £600,000 to P&O since the mass sackings for movements of freight and business travel. Separately, British International Investment, which operates as part of the Foreign Office, has paid £228 million to DP World for work modernising three ports in Africa. This means your employment is terminated with immediate effect. Last March, on a Zoom meeting, p and fired 800 crew without notice or consultation. Security marched them off the company's ships to be replaced by cheaper agency workers. We did choose not to consult. p and boss admitted the company had knowingly broken the law, but he insisted the action was necessary to avoid bankruptcy. At the time, the government called p and behaviour despicable and Grant Shapps promised action. For our part, we're reviewing all government contracts with P&O ferries as a matter of urgency and, Madam Deputy Speaker, with DP World. One of the seafarers who was dismissed by P&O last year is unimpressed. The government don't have the, the appetite to hold to account these corporate lawbreakers and when they should be standing up for the British public. 
Tonight, the government told us that it has acted swiftly and decisively against P&O Ferry's appalling treatment of its staff. It says all contracts held with DP World and P&O have been reviewed as promised and it only uses their services when there is no other alternative. The government also points out that the Home Office did cancel a contract with P&O Ferries last May. The government has changed the law to compel P&O to pay its agency workers the national minimum wage, but the legislation won't take effect until next year, so for now the company can continue to pay an average of £5.50 an hour. The government has also introduced a voluntary seafarer's charter which sets basic standards for crews. Last month at a ceremony in Paris, DFDS, Stenoline and Brittany ferries signed it. P&O has not. P&O Ferries insists it treats its crews well. The company told us it has returned to strength and is now back as the biggest ferry operator on the English Channel. It says the decision to sack staff last year has saved the company and secured 2,200 jobs. John Hills, News at 10 in Dover. The retired British miner who was only freed from jail in Cyprus 10 days ago may now end up going on trial again on the island, accused of murdering his wife. David Hunter was convicted of manslaughter after his wife Janice begged him to kill her because of the pain from her blood cancer. But the Cypriot Attorney General has made a late appeal against the manslaughter verdict and his release. It's understood Mr Hunter could now face a charge of premeditated murder. Now, it could have been worse, it could have been better. The England footballer Lauren James will have to sit out two World Cup games for her red card offence of stamping on a Nigerian player. She'll miss Saturday morning's quarter-final against Colombia and should the Lionesses win that, the semi-final next Wednesday. If, and it's a big if, they reach the final a week on Saturday, she will, though, be available for that. Well, Steve is in Tergal, where the England team is based. Early morning to you, Steve. It might have been expected this, but it's not the best news ahead of this big match this weekend? No, certainly not, Julie, but I think actually England will be quite relieved because privately they were expecting a three-match ban, which, as you say, would have ruled Lauren James out the rest of the tournament. But, of course, we're a long way from where we are today uh, and the final, and James will be missed. She made the difference when she came on in the first group game. She was the difference in the second group game, and she was sensational uh, against China. Against Nigeria, it was pretty different. She was marked out of the game, and I think we all saw that the Lionesses suffered as a result. But uh, since that red card, England have been planning on how to beat Colombia without James. It won't be easy, remember. Colombia have already beat one of the favourites here, Germany, and they're a physical side too. And I think what happened to Lauren James should serve as a warning to the Lionesses that not only are they going to have to play very, very well, they're also going to have to keep their discipline if they're going to progress further in this tournament. OK, Steve, an exciting prospect indeed. Thank you for that. And England's quarter-final against Colombia is on ITV1 and ITVX on Saturday morning. Coverage begins at 10.45. To the England men's captain now, and after all the toing and froing over Harry Kane's future, it's time to make up your mind, Harry. His club, Tottenham Hotspur, has finally reached an agreement with Bayern Munich over a transfer deal thought to be worth around £86 million. Kane himself now has to decide. For a few extraordinary minutes, the first three tourists to take a Virgin Galactic away day flight to the edge of space had the weight of the world lifted from their shoulders. They floated in reduced gravity while gazing down on the planet they call home. They comprised a mother and daughter who had won their tickets in a raffle and an 80-year-old with Parkinson's disease who bought his 18 years ago when he was a youthful 62. In this new era of space flight, <laughs> leaving Earth's orbit begins on a runway rather than a launch site. And those on board, ticket holders rather than astronauts with years of training. Three, two, one, release, release, release. At 50,000 feet, the rocket carrying Virgin Galactic's first space tourists ignited, bringing its passengers literally out of this world. Incredible. Awesome. Go Keisha, go Anna, <laughs> go John. For John Goodwin, the feel of zero gravity has been a long wait. The 80-year-old former Olympic canoeist from Staffordshire bought his ticket back in 2005 at a cost of a quarter of a million dollars. But in 2011, 
he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I thought that's the end of me going into space. I'm hoping that I instill in other people around the world, as well as people with Parkinson's, that it doesn't stop you doing things that are out of the normal. Back on terra firma, cheering John on, a watch party featuring his local Parkinson's support group. Far above, the other two passenger seats were taken by a mother and daughter duo who won the tickets in a competition. The daughter, Anastasia Myers, is a student at the University of Aberdeen and brought mementos for her journey into space. I have a bunch of photos of the most important people in my life. And since I couldn't take them physically, I took them in photos, um, and I hope that they will appreciate that. So I appreciate their presence with me. Um, I also took a pin from my university. Um, they supported me through all of this, and I hope to support them equally as well. From 290,000 feet up, that's 55 miles, the ticket holders were graced with a view few in all of human history have seen firsthand. But these are just the first steps in private space travel, because today's voyage, costing hundreds of thousands per passenger, spent just a few minutes beyond Earth's atmosphere. Sam Holder, News at 10. It isn't just film and TV production that has been halted by the actors and writers' strikes in the United States, so has television's big night out. The Emmys have been postponed. In a hint that no one in Hollywood thinks an end to the strikes is imminent, the awards ceremony has been pushed back to the middle of January. That'll take it into the film awards season. Normally, the Emmys are held in September. Finally, when everyone's favourite 80s pop band Duran Duran, well, mine anyway, finally entered Rock and Roll's Hall of Fame last year, guitarist Andy Taylor was missing. He was hunkered down, confronting incurable prostate cancer. Since then, he's had some revolutionary treatment and is back. Well, enough to finish a solo album he'd started and to look forward with some hope to the future. It is an uplifting new song, but from a man who has known very dark days. Andy Taylor is about to release an album that will reflect, at times, the trauma he's been through in the last few years. There's a couple of songs to, to my family which were written from that perspective of... if, if of you might, uh, It's kind of... You, 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 won't be, you won't hear me say this much longer. So you put it in a, into a song. That's a difficult bit. <sighs> but yeah, you, I mean, if it, it, it all comes out. The heady days of his time as guitarist with Duran Duran seemed far away when he was diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer in 2018 just as he'd started work on his new solo album. When the band were inducted into the prestigious Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last year, he was notably absent, writing to them about his illness. And then, of course, these medical experts heard and contacted you. Well, that was a great irony. You know, you miss the biggest night of your life and then you save your life. He may not be able to do this on stage right now, but the groundbreaking new private treatment Taylor is on called PSMA therapy, while not a cure, has, he says, given him the chance of a much longer life than he'd been expecting. What has this treatment given you? I hope I've been given every dream in life I ever wanted, including my life back. And it's very compelling the, 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 the most salient aspect of, of, of where you can help people is to inform them and talk about this. His old bandmates have rallied round. Next week, they're staging a benefit concert in the US for the Cancer Awareness Trust. While Duran Duran are performing that concert, you're going to be in hospital having your next round of treatment. Ironically, yes. If ever there was a moment where the worlds perfectly collide, in a sense, his album is out next month, and its brighter tracks, like this one, reflect a new hope of more music to come. 
Nina Nanar, News at 10 in the Cotswolds. And all the best, Andy, from all of us. That is News at 10 for this Thursday evening. From everyone here, good night, and we will see you again tomorrow. Good night.